A warm welcome to all of you um, to our event uh, organized by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung um, on the uh, typing of we're becoming estranged from the city, uh, fighting against uh, displacement and gentrification. I'm Anastasia Blinsov, and I am in charge of education. Um, I'm in the education coordinator in the area of housing and uh, urban policies here at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in Berlin. Let me uh, introduce our guests. Um, a warm welcome to David McEwen. Uh, David is an architect and activist in the Latin village in Tottenham in London. We also uh, have with us tonight uh, Nilofa Tajeri. Uh, she's also an activist and an architect, and she is involved in the struggles at the Hermannplatz in Neukölln in Berlin. Uh, a warm welcome to Conny Wagner. Uh, you are part of the uh, initiative called Ora Nostra, an uh, initiative of small business owners at the Oranienstraße in Berlin, here in Kreuzberg. And uh, a warm welcome also to Erjan Yazaroglu. You are uh, running the Café Kotti here uh, uh, at the Kotbusser Tour, and uh, you are also part of the um, uh, Tenants Council um, of the Neue Kreuzberger Zentrum, Neues Kreuzberger Zentrum, and you are there uh, in the um, uh, working group on um, uh, of small business owners. Uh, we are here at the Südblock. Um, and we are recording this event um, for us and for you. So we are right here in the center of um, uh, gentrification and displacement, um, where uh, tenants and small business owners are being displaced. Um, and at the same time, it's also a hub of resistance. Uh, Kreuzberg is a hub of resistance uh, that is articulating itself um, in our cities, in Germany, but also internationally. Uh, Kreuzberg is a symbol of the resistance of tenants and small business owners against uh, a uh, uh, urban policy and city planning uh, that is against uh, uh, the people, basically. So uh, from the 70s and from the 80s, uh, we have the uh, uh, squatters movement and, and other movements that waged an, an, uh, a very uh, successful struggle against this displacement and against the um, uh, displacement and the uh, uh, demolitions that took place um, um, uh, in the guise of urban renewal. So Kreuzberg, this uh, district, this um, uh, part of the town, has been um, uh, um, 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 one of the centers of these uh, struggles um, back then, and it is uh, so today. And um, with many um, um, communities, migrant communities, um, many of the uh, uh, contract workers um, from Turkey uh, came here and uh, w were accommodated then in in housing here in this in this district. Um, it was planned that workers would return to Turkey, but they stayed and they fought together with the squatters and they organized, they self-organized. Um, so the left and uh, and. Um, um, the resistance of the squatters movement um, has characterized this district, but also the uh, self-organization uh, among migrant communities, uh, which is also reflected here at the Cottbus Autor um, by initiatives that continue uh, these struggles, such as Cotti and Co. And the squatters movement is also, together with the migrant uh, community organization, uh, is also a good example for spaces um, and places of alternative um, uh, economies. They did not squat only uh, residential units, but they created uh, small businesses and uh, uh, spaces for, for small businesses, for example. Um, the, and spaces f for collective uh, uh, construction and, and building to, to provide social services and uh, repair services, bike repair services, for example. So this is um, the history, the, the famous history of uh, the mixing uh, in, in Kreuzberg, which is basically mixed use, mixed use uh, uh, tenants and uh, residential units and also commercial units and, and, and spaces um, in, in those buildings. And that was part and parcel of the uh, uh, success uh, back then that they were able to protect these buildings. Um, the um, without this resistance, um, the um, 
um, city planning would not have been the same. There was a, um, a, a road that was uh, planned and the uh, housing complex, the Neue Kreuzberger Zentrum, uh, which is around, uh, which is surrounding the the place, uh, uh, the square called uh, Cottbuser Tor. Um, if ha this had been, you know, basically uh, implemented and, and and pushed through, uh, it would have been to the detriment of the diversity of this district. So uh, there's an awareness uh, here who is creating these spaces, who is enabling these spaces, and who is leading the resistance. Uh, so many of the small businesses that we see here emerged thanks to the establishment of the so-called guest workers, the contract workers um, that were brought into Germany that established, uh, that managed to establish their own infrastructure, that managed to meet their own needs um, thanks to the small businesses they were able to, to establish. So. Um, they built the necessary infrastructure and they continue to struggle to fight for the uh, um, the preservation of that infrastructure and of their small businesses as well. So the question that arises is, uh, where does the who is perpetrating who is the, who are the perpetrators of the gentrification and, and displacement? Uh, so who are the opponents? Who are the uh, of uh, those that that resist um, and that? In that organize this resistance, uh, and this is a question at the local level, at the at, at the national level, but also at international level. These are um, large uh, corporations um, that uh, basically uh, buy up um, the the city, and they drown out. Uh, tenants and also small businesses. And we see this across the board, not only in Berlin, um, but uh, David will tell us about uh, one example in London, where we see the same resistance against uh, gentrification and displacement and against these large investors, these large uh, corporations is taking place and is being uh, um, uh, organized. These are questions that we're grappling with um, at the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung as well. Who is the city for? Whom is the city for? Uh, who has the right to the city? Who owns uh, the buildings uh, in, in, in the city? Uh, who has access to the city? Um, the city is made for whom? Uh, and who uh, makes the city? Who builds the city? And who profits from the city? That people are making these, uh, uh, this city and our cities livable um, and, uh, and also um, make them accessible uh, to to others. Uh, let me let us start um, uh, with uh, your statements. Um, I'd like to invite David to uh, give his statement first. Let's start with you because I I just outlined the history of um, this district, the, the Kreuzberg district here in Berlin, and what were the reasons for the developments and the resistance that we have seen and that we continue to see. And you are one of um, um, we're part of the uh, community plan of the uh, Latin village in Tottenham in London. Can you uh, briefly describe the history of the resistance and where did you become part of this resistance? Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and also the opportunity to share a bit more about what we're trying to do in this um, small area of North London. Um, so my name is David McEwen. Um, I'm a, a director of an architecture practice called Unit 38, alongside two colleagues, one of whom is behind the camera. Um, my involvement in, in the area, in Latin Village, began approximately six years ago. And it was inspired by my own personal history. So I was born in Colombia. Um, there are certain areas within London that um, I, I found it enormously helpful to uh, understand and develop my own identity and my culture. And one of these is this market in, in Seven Sisters in, in Tottenham, in North London. Um, I knew immediately from going there that this was a sort of magical space that really played many different roles. And the, the longer I spent there, the longer I spent time there, I realized that it really continues to evolve and, and really offers so much more. It's, it's a space that continues to, to evolve and provide these different sorts of services and um, sort of meanings to people. Um, so I always like to think of this area um, with a question, and that's what, what sort of roles or what is this space? Um, and I, I really desperately enjoy doing that because you end up realizing that it has, it, it plays so many different roles. It's at once, it's a place of business, it's a, a place to socialize and have fun. Um, 
it's a place to learn and educate. Um, it's also an area that a lot of people turn to for much needed sort of advice, um, rights and advice, places where you can find people to help you um, find a place to live, find some jobs. A lot of the time we uh, we have a bit of a, it's, it's quite uh, an interesting effect. So you, if you spend enough time in the market, it's quite a common thing to see people arrive straight from the airport with their luggage there. Um, it has a reputation as somewhere where if you're arriving for the first time, you go there for some sort of help. Um, so this is, this is a space that feels very unique and particularly unique to this Latin American community. Um, so immediately you recognize that these are spaces that have to be protected um, because they, they are the ones that are particularly under threat within London. Um, it's not, it, it's quite a, a common actually occurrence within London to see these spaces as the ones targeted for, for regeneration. They're, they're ones that um, people really see to as opportunities for, particularly developers see to as opportunities for further, for further regeneration developments, that sort of things. Um, what we found in Seven Sisters was a developer was trying to take this market and take the block to demolish it, to turn it into hundreds of luxury flats. Um, and the, these are, this is a flat, this, this, sorry, this is a development that would cater towards an outside community, not the local community. Um, so immediately we realized that there was, there was some sort of resistance that we had to mount, a, a sort of struggle that we had to mount. So from the outset six years ago, I joined an, a campaign that has been um, protesting against these plans to demolish the market. That would have started in 2004. Um, and from the outset, we always saw uh, alternative development as being this weapon against um, the, the regeneration that was intended within the, within the local area. Um, so my colleagues and I, for the past, since around 2018, we've been working on the fourth iteration of this community plan that we really see as this bottom-up alternative development to what the developers are trying to do and what a lot of councils throughout London are trying to do. And it's based off of the idea that um, these are spaces that desperately deserve to be protected, but we can almost build off of those qualities, these different roles that the market has, to take over a, a vacant space that has remained vacant since the 1970s and really prove that this sort of alternative bottom-up development is possible. Um, it has been a lot of work, and we've found a lot of support from both the Latin American community and other migrants' communities throughout London. Um, but also from people, I, th I think it's quite common throughout London as well to find people who are just completely tired of these same sorts of regeneration developments that come in and destroy communities. They offer one vision of what London should be. Um, and I think we've, through our work, we've tried to prove that there is this alternative vision of what's possible. Danke dir. Ähm, ich finde, da gibt es äh, auf jeden Fall deutliche Parallelen auch zu dem, was äh, den, das Corpus Ator äh, historisch und auch heute noch prägt. Vor allen Dingen diese Idee einer ähm, Stadt des Ankommens oder eines Ortes des Ankommens. Ähm, genau, und da würde ich Eltern dich gerne bitten, ähm, einmal... I would like to ask uh, you, Erdjan to describe your work at Cottbus Artois and to tell us whether you have similar um, issues here as uh, similar to the ones that David has been describing for Tottenham. Well, I was born in Turkey and I um, came to Germany in 1982 as a young man. And Germany was a new home to me. I uh, decided to come here and I decided to feel at home here. And what I noticed when I arrived here was diversity. So a, a diversity of, of uh, immigration backgrounds, of uh, political stances, and I identified with that. So Corpus Ator was a an, a very interesting place to me, and there was, of course, a lot of drug dealing going on here. And so it was a space that was perceived as very provocative or as an eyesore by many people. There was a lot of alcoholism and um, drug use here. 
and there was an anti-drug uh, campaign. And I was involved in this as a social worker. And then I noticed there were rent hikes and similar developments and a great many immigrants from Turkey were moving away. because they were all in need of aid and this created they they were all on the dole or many of them were and the um the the city was refusing to pay their rent telling them they had to move to a smaller apartment and then i began cooperating with the association Koti and cool local association and got to meet a great many people who were coming together here uh, struggling to keep their apartment who felt at home here i felt at home in kreuzberg and if i was to be told that i have to move away from kreuzberg into another neighborhood i would feel i would not feel at home in that other neighborhood so there came a point when the Neues Kreuzbecker Zentrum, this complex of buildings here in Kreuzberg, was to be sold to a private investor. And we all got together and started a campaign to prevent the sale of the building complex to this private investor, Padovic. This involved, um, a, you know, organizing among us as tenants, we decided we don't want our home to be sold to a private investor. There are about 390 uh, apartments in the building. M many of them are welfare recipients. Then we have self-employed people, artists living here. And we have about 100 small businesses some office spaces and there was a great deal of fear among all of us we were afraid of becoming like other places in Kreuzberg like places in Adalbertstrasse where we would have to be paying very high rents to stay here about eight years ago the tenants council was formed here in Neues Kreuzberg at Zentrum and we set up work groups, a work group responsible for security issues, a work group responsible for um, the interests of small business owners. And we wanted to prevent a situation where the immigrants who live here and feel at home here leave um, um, Neues Kreuzberg at Zentrum, or we wanted to avoid a situation where they lose their home. Because we, as Kreuzberg, are not perceived as proper citizens, as voters, so we had to confront ourselves with politicians. Whether people come from Turkey, or whether they identify as Kurds, or whether they were born here in Kreuzberg, we have more than a hundred different cultures living in this space, and this diversity to me was a resource. We wanted to organize encounters, and I said, people, we need to act. in a reasonable way, we need to engage in a dialogue with politicians. And I believe we have achieved this. Tenants are still able to live here. We have had we, we, we have an agreement where the rents cannot be raised for a certain number of years. So we have achieved that. And now we're struggling to protect the small business owners. Because these are small businesses run by people who don't have much money. Their businesses run on the basis of their savings. They have invested their savings into their small business. 
And they are afraid of losing those small businesses now. And the public housing corporation Givelbach has now taken over the building complex and people are worried about what will happen next. And then we had the situation with COVID which reinforced these fears. And we are trying to speak to politicians and to the administration to find ways to preserve the diversity that we have here at Koti, which we consider our home. When I was working as a social worker initially, it was a, a different situation. I began to work as a political activist to help build campaigns in order to um, push for these goals that I've been outlining. Connie, I'd like to ask you, because you're uh, a member of the campaign Ora Nostra, a campaign run by small business owners in Kreuzberg, and as Erchan said, these are spaces in which people um, have um, invested all of their often meager financial resources. And so these people are now struggling against the uh, selling out of the city. What are the struggles of Ora Nostra? What have you been doing so far and what successes have you achieved? Well, I need to say that Neues Kreuzberger Zentrum was rescued by this legal arrangement that we have in Germany whereby um, the purchase of real estate by investors can be prevented and the city can has a right to first purchase. But this uh, law has been um, strict has been uh, uh, declared unconstitutional um, by Germany's constitutional court. So this is something that would no longer be possible today and this is a great loss. As far as Ora Nostra is concerned, we are working with various other initiatives such as Bisim, Glorreiche. Uh, there's a new initiative that has just constituted itself which is um, representative of the entire 36 um, neighborhood, which is a part of Kreuzberg named after the former the um, postal code. And we have set up an alliance. We have formed an alliance called Volle Breitseite. And we have engaged in various cultural activities and political demonstrations. And we've tried to draw attention to the situation in our street, Oranienstraße, to describe it briefly the street has basically been purchased by a great a number of international investors whom we are unable to communicate with we know who is behind them and in some cases these are um, financial corporations who are um, uh, operating with money um, provided by investors who don't necessarily know what is being done with their money. And we do not really have a way of influencing these corporations. And this means that when um, rent contracts are not, are terminated or when people are evicted, then Of course, um, there, there's, al there's always the, um, the hope by international investors that they will be able to charge higher rent. Um, so we uh, have rents of about 14 to 16 euros per square meter, which is quite a lot, even though it was still affordable. But now these rents have gone up to as much as, as, as 38 euros per square meter. So an enormous rent hike and um, people who have um, had their small businesses in um, the place for 35 years or longer have had to move away and have had to give up their small business. I believe it's worrying 
that we have so few possibilities to take influence, to exert influence, and that there, uh, there's uh, so, so little um, reflection on how we could expand our influence. It doesn't seem to be the goal of politicians to preserve diversity or to protect the livelihood of small business owners. Apart from Enkatsit, most people who have rent contracts are subject to significant rent hikes, and this threatens their business model, even if they keep revising their business model and have kept trying to adapt to the changes in the economic situation. So sometimes it's almost amusing to see the way people reinvent their small business. They start out maybe selling vegetables and then they decide to sell uh, clothes for toddlers and if that doesn't work they will start selling organic foods and in the end um, they might say, well, there's nothing else I can do. I have to pay 44 euros per uh, square meter, so I need to um, uh, think of something new, and they end up um, selling um, fast food. And so this is, uh, um, a lot of small business owners have adapted to the touristification of the uh, neighborhood, and these changes um, have, have been necessary to allow people to uh, continue to live and work here. Nevertheless, we can see, and this is also related to the closings associated with the pandemic, this these these business models no longer work so that increasingly we have large um, corporations who are running stores or we have stores that don't have enough customers to stay afloat economically that's something i can speak to a bit more later but it seems to be or rather these we have businesses that are um, run even though they have no customers, it seems to be, uh, they're, they're simply treated as lucrative investments. So we've tried to protect the rights of small business owners as tenants to, uh, we've, we've in, engaged in a dialogue with the government trying to propose certain legal protections, but so far, without success, we were told, no, the market will take care of these issues. And so we were told it's important to do more for small business owners. So let's um, see to what, uh, as long as the basic uh, provision of amenities on the local level is functioning, we don't need to um, worry too much about small business owners. Then there was another initiative in which um, we joined forces with other initiatives and began to think about how in certain uh, areas that are very much at risk from these developments where diversity is being lost. What can we do to preserve diversity in those areas? And we developed a series of criteria. What are areas that are at risk from these developments and how could these areas be preserved? And we started very modestly and our proposals were debated by the parliament, but then um, ultimately, they were rejected on the basis of expert opinions. And of course, this is very frustrating to the people who are already at the end of their tether because of the pandemic. They have used up all of their savings. They no longer have any savings. And if they were to lose their small business or if they were to want to retire, they would have no resources left whatsoever. Do you want me to speak more about that? No, I would say we can talk more about that later. I'd like to uh, pose a question to Nilufar. Can you 
talked about the small business owners who are being displaced or who would be displaced. Um, thanks to the initiatives, um, we hear about those small business owners and their stories. But just as David said uh, earlier, these are global corporations and global uh, uh, companies, and often we do not know their names, who's behind them, um, and what you know, cap, uh, the face of capital, basically, we do not know very often. You are active at Hermannplatz here in Neukölln in Berlin. And uh, um, what is the resistance, the state of the resistance at, uh, at Hermannplatz against these corporations and against uh, uh, capital? Well, it's a different picture at Hermannplatz, I think. Uh, the, uh, the, the large real estate uh, corporation is very prominent and is very strong and has a very uh, clear profile as well. Um, they have a very sophisticated uh, narrative uh, that they are using um, to, uh, to portray themselves um, and also they're, they're using at the political in the political arena and in the media. Uh, to way to exert influence not only on policies um, but also on the public. Uh, so this is a real a sophisticated uh, concept that they uh, have come up with, uh, or a very sophisticated strategy uh, that the uh, uh, the corporation Zigna is is employing, because they have experience in other conflicts in other cities. So they have developed um, such uh, this, this kind of strategy. So it's a real estate uh, corporation. Um, in 2014, however, they bought up uh, the department store chain Karstadt. And together with Karstadt, they also acquired the buildings that had been owned previously by Karstadt. And they also merged with Galeria Kaufhof, another department store chain. So it is now also the only uh, department store corporation. Um, it has emerged as such. And it's a developer um, It's in the cities, but also uh, it is also a huge employer. So that is a combination that is a mix that leads to a, a specific uh, uh, urban policy situation uh, that is reflected at Hermannplatz in the situation at Hermannplatz. And following the uh, COVID-related closures, the corporation decided to close uh, 22 uh, chapters um, in, uh, in, uh, in Germany, uh, 22 uh, shops in um, uh, department stores in, in Germany. Um, um, the resistance has uh, has emerged. We have a, a very uh, controversial political situation, a divided uh, a division, even within um, uh, uh, the parties. Uh, there are different positions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these corporations. But due to the closures, due to the COVID uh, crisis and the uh, um, uh, the threat of, of mass layoffs, uh, the Senate um, uh, took a position uh, on this, and they uh, they signed a declaration of intent, uh, a memorandum of understanding, to give the go-ahead for the uh, uh, large uh, projects that are planned by the corporation. And one of these projects is supposed to take is to is supposed to be realized, implemented at uh, the Hermannplatz between those two districts, uh, Kreuzberg and Neukölln in Berlin. So we started uh, working on this um, and, and organizing resistance against this uh, two years ago. When I read about the plans to demolish the, uh, uh, the building, the Karstadt building at Hermannplatz, and they want to leave intact or uh, 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 rebuild um, a facade, uh, a historicizing facade of the building, uh, I felt under threat. I was confused, but I also felt that I was under threat of uh, um, displacement, uh, but also in terms of the rents, um, the rent hikes, but also in terms of my identity, because uh, I've 
moved to that uh, uh, that neighborhood. I moved to Neukölln uh, 12 years ago. It is a space of the diaspora. It's a diasporic space for me, uh, where uh, we see emerging different identities um, that uh, that. That are con that involved in a constant process of negotiation. Uh, it is one of the spaces, or it is the space where I first felt at home, uh, where I felt at home for the first time in Germany. And I'm not the only one with this experience. It is shared by many others. At the same time, we have a very uh, racist discourse and stigmatizing discourse about this uh, district uh, in Berlin, but also across Germany. Uh, over the past, past 15 years, this uh, district has been demonized uh, in, a, in a way and devalued uh, by such a racist discourse. Uh, so this discursive uh, practice of devalu uh, devaluing and, 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 and demonizing uh, this, um, uh, this district has led to, uh, uh, to policymakers uh, um, and to, to private investors uh, to say we have to change something at, at the level of uh, um, the, the, the funding uh, programs, the, 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 the urban developers, the urban planners, the policy makers. Uh, they're pointing to the headlines uh, saying, look, there's, you have a lot of bad press. Uh, things are, you know, it's a dire situation in, this, uh, in these districts, so we need to um, step in and, 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 and correct this and, and change something uh, um, also on the level of, uh, of urban uh, planning. So we've seen this strategy employed um, in, in many uh, communities uh, across many districts. Uh, so uh, the, the idea is that you know, to change something means to bring in white people. So we need to, in order to improve things, or uh, things are only uh, good, basically, um, if uh, enough white people live in a certain neighborhood, in a certain district. Um, and that uh, leads to a kind of feeling of superiority. Um, um, you know, once we move in, the white people move in, um, things uh, turn, uh, change for the better. So, um, this the the new developments uh, they do not only bring uh, opportunities but they also um, uh, uh, bring about a certain identity uh, or try to bring in an, 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 a new identity because your identity is not uh, appreciated in society so this has a historic tradition in germany that this um uh, it is not being questioned. The media does not question that either. What does it mean to go into a neighborhood, to go into spaces and 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 uh, and, and spaces that is characterized by um, the everyday, by a modesty, by a humbleness? But there's no building that stands out and says, uh, "I am here a symbol of uh, this, that, or the other." Um, it is, you know. Uh, uh, bereft of, of, of meaning or neutral in its in its meaning and that um, renders uh, the space um, uh, very open to um, to receiving and 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 giving space to many uh, to many cultures so as soon as you give some um, uh, some importance also in the sense of cultural imperialism to this space that lends something of that meaning to this space, um, it is uh, it is doing something not only uh, at the economic level, uh, so it's not just about displacement, but it's also about portraying a cultural superiority uh, and also the, uh, the power to define um, about what will the future look like and who has a say in this? So the initiative um, Hermannplatz that we founded two and a half years ago uh, is not only uh, an, an, uh, um, an um, initiative uh, involved in urban policy um, uh, issues, but also an anti-racist initiative that uh, reads these developments as um, a structural racism um, that that is being um, uh, that that plays out in um, in in urban uh, planning and urban um, development as as well. So we have done a lot of work. We've put a lot of uh, effort in this we, to slow this process down uh, by you know uh, 
by getting out there, by spreading the word, by uh, showing resistance, we uh, also were able to you know, shape the discourse. Many people, thanks to our work, now understand what what is this space uh, and why is it worth to defend this space um, and resist these um, these processes and that is uh, at the discursive level this is um, so we've, we've come a long way at this uh, level and we also uh, did a lot of work uh, uh, on the streets we have um, uh, and we we uh, inform uh, uh, people out on the streets um, we are uh, uh, telling people this is a center this is one of the nodes of the city it is a public space there is a, uh, a certain public that is always present at this in this space without being able to describe them or to define them in any way because there's a lot of fluctuation so uh, thanks to this continuous work uh, out on the streets we were able to uh, create um, a form of relationship and this was reflected also at the beginning of uh, November. This discourse on the streets and among the neighbors, among the residents, uh, has changed. There was one event, one kickoff event, for uh, the uh, investigation for or research for the master plan uh, pr uh, process. Uh, so that was meant to be the kickoff event for that. And 250 people uh, came together. Um, you know, to bring in their perspectives, their diverse uh, perspectives, uh, to uh, level criticism and to issue a critique um, um, uh, of this uh, uh, procedure and of these uh, plans. And that was very enriching for us as an, uh, as an initiative. We saw that, that we were able to, to, um, to, um, to mobilize um, the, uh, the the residents and the neighbors, and we were able to uh, create knowledge, uh, and they reclaim they claim that knowledge. So that was uh, really a, a very um, Im important um, uh, moment for us. It's a huge um, community of, of neighbors and, and residents. It's a huge area, uh, but despite it being so huge and so. Um, uh, so dispersed in uh, such a fluctuating space, we can create uh, relationships and, and strong bonds. So you are describing that this kind of displacement of small business owners is not just a, a problem for those individual business owners, but it's a structural problem that operates at the uh, the the uh, uh, urban policy and urban development uh, level and, and also is an anti-racist, um, uh, is a reflective of, of structural anti uh, of racism, um, of structural racism. You are, Erjan, how were you able to, to uh, train uh, small business holders um, um, to become, um, uh, to become a uh, Agents, um, uh, in this sense, uh, to vis-à-vis -vis, uh, uh, the uh, the authorities, uh, to have the necessary tools available to them, and to uh, uh, to uh, uh, have the necessary skills and arguments uh, for that. We created a transcultural space. Um, uh, or that is a resource. We use diversity as a resource. Um, we see ourselves as uh, as as people um, uh, coming together. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a, it's a mayor uh, or some represent representative or some um, uh, politicians. Everyone was saying. Let's make diversity our wealth and our resource. And our working group, we are trying to convey to policymakers that we are enriching society by our diversity, with our diversity. Uh, we've done this uh, for the past 50 years. Uh, but this diversity is not being recognized uh, and, and 
on many levels in society. So uh, we are creating that diversity and we are preserving that diversity. We are here, uh, people in Kreuzberg, in Berlin, in, 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 in Germany. And this is what we're doing. So they have changed their 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 views. They are able now to uh, to state their positions, their situations, vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, authorities on all levels, and to discuss uh, with them, with the Senate as well. So we have drug users. There is a lack of spaces for these people. More than 200 people, drug users, who have to consume drugs in public space because there are no spaces for them. They take drugs in the stairways, they live in the stairways, they sleep there. And this is an outcome of the ignorance of politicians because they're, we're dealing with people who often don't have the right um, to vote. Um, and this, of course, is not their fault. It's a an outcome of the political decisions that have been made here. So we need to create a situation where people are heard and where they are capable of taking action. And that's why I said earlier, ever since 2004, we have been seeing a situation where there's a large potential for the development of a kind of mafia. There are so many casinos in this neighborhood. Why has this been allowed? Or also betting offices, which are essentially money laundering operations. And poor people spend the little bit of money they have in these casinos, essentially giving it to these mafia structures. And so we said, we don't want any betting offices in our building. We don't want any casinos in the building. We don't want these money laundering operations in our building. They're as much of a problem as the drug users. And we did succeed in getting these betting offices and casinos evicted. We have um, politicians who, who came here spoke to people a little bit. So, pressuring people to sell their small businesses. And we spoke to the small business owners and told them, don't agree to this. We spoke um, to our landlords and managed to get to win a reduction of the rent of these small businesses. In Kreuzberg, there's a strong left wing scene. And it's, I, I would always say, we need to struggle against ignorance. What we're trying to do in our dialogue with politicians is to win recognition as citizens. We want our small business owners to be respected as citizens, to be given their citizens' rights. So the clans, the mafia structures that are active here, 
these they they are the ones who are providing the security forces to the vaccination centers they they are the bouncers working um in uh, at the bars around here Th these are people who have been to prison this is the reality these clans they have engaged in robberies they've got they then go to prison and they uh, get back out they have been involved in major robberies these are are these people are the problem they have been allowed to proliferate in the area so crime has been allowed to proliferate this is and this of course is always associated in the way it's spoken about with immigration these clans engaged in violence against each other and we try to make a case for the dignity and the importance of immigration to break this association with crime in the 80s when i came here i was i was uh, considered a foreigner my grandchildren i don't know what they will be called uh, having been born here so there are all of these categories national categories religious categories there's a major problem with islamophobia i am known as someone on the left but p other people have gotten into trouble because they have a beard in my cafe, Cafe Koti, people have been able to sell cocaine, beat up people. I knew as a social worker, but the police didn't know. So I spoke to um, the head of police and I told him, and he was incredibly arrogant to me. And he was effectively insulting me. And this is often what our encounter with German society looks like. So I am angry with our politicians because we're still having a debate on integration in Germany. And Cottbus Atua, with its diversity, with its small businesses, is something that needs to be protected and given a voice. It's a question of uh, developing, of giving people uh, the self-confidence that will prevent them from subordinating themselves to these racist discourse, to be proud of their differences. What I believe is that it's an asset for our society if we have people with different backgrounds. I don't want to, I say, we need to engage with one another and engage with politicians and this will work so i and the people struggling with me we're setting up an association we're trying to unite all of the small businesses in order to build a common front against these international investors. We want to build solidarity between small business owners. Throughout Kreuzberg, throughout 
Berlin, and even on the European level. If we can achieve that, we'll have achieved a great deal. Thank you, Ajahn. I believe you've um, touched on a number of very important points that were also mentioned earlier by David. You spoke about transcultural spaces that um, allow for solidarity between people despite the differences between them. And David, you said earlier that the Latin village is a place where people come together, where they arrive and are able to share a space despite their differences. I wanted to ask you, how can such spaces for all people, what, uh, how can they be developed in a space such as the Latin village? How can they be secured and defended? What does the community in the Latin village look like and how do people become a part of it? How are they included in that community? Thank you. Um, I think a lot of the points that have been raised are, are things that we've encountered. Um, I think something that's quite nice, um, something that's been a great benefit to us is really making the case for diversity. It's recognizing the benefits that it can bring. Um, it's also proving that in supporting in supporting diversity, in allowing these, in supporting these spaces to exist as well. Um, it gives rise to these other potential roles that these spaces can play. Um, as well, it allows us to um, really push for the idea of solidarity with other groups around London. Something that we found when we, re when we refer to Latin Village as Latin Village, while predominantly the, the strongest population there or the strongest representation is from South America, it's actually a fairly international space. And that reflects the diversity that you get throughout the rest of London as well. Um, I think uh, when it comes to the way in which the, the, that sort of diversity has come about or the strengths that it can bring, it's actually happened fairly naturally. The market itself began around 1980 or so, and it wasn't, it wasn't at that point a Latin American market or a predominantly Latin American market. It was one that catered mostly towards the local Afro-Caribbean community. And as that, the dynamics of London have shifted, these very uh, low cost, low rent spaces have created the opportunities for recently arrived migrants to create their own businesses, to develop their own livelihoods. Um, and I think having those spaces and having those spaces together, having these multiple communities together, um, has created a, a really productive sense of diversity in which there's this massive amounts of collaboration and um, this kind of shared goal. I, I think one of the one of the great things about the Seven Sisters campaign is that it has allowed this this mixed diverse community within the market to fight together towards one goal, which is to both protect the space that they have, um, but also improve it. So to, to be prop propositional, to manage, to imagine this alternative vision for what's possible. And I think that resonates with a lot of other people within London, a lot of other communities. Um, it's this idea that we all have a space there, that we all benefit from this, this sense of diversity that, um, that we can create something uh, new and special the same way we have already created it. Um, I'm not sure if that's, if that's answered your question or if you have. Uh, yeah, can I yes, it does. Thank you very much. So I would say we'll return to what you've just spoken to in a moment uh, concerning the Latin village as an alternative vision of inclusion, a space that is created um, to, and, and to what extent this this diversity can be an, an element or, or a factor, a mobilizing factor. I'd like to ask you, Nilufar, we've spoken uh, quite a bit about how these individual spaces have developed, but the development of the Hermannplatz area, of course, is one that affects adjoining neighborhoods. Perhaps you could speak to how the development on the Hermannplatz affects um, adjoining areas, because of course, um, I would want to know, are there material effects on, say, the, the structure of small businesses in the neighborhood as a whole? 
Well, whether or not the development on Hermannplatz affects adjoining areas is something that we can't say clearly at this point, but if we look to international examples, we can see that projects of urban renewal, um, large construction projects, often entail mechanisms of displacement and large rises in the value of real estate. So I think we need to address something that happens before that. We need to ask the question, what has led to an interest in Hermannplatz? And the last 10 to 15 years have been decisive. This was the time when, on the one hand, there were areas that were designated as needing to be refurbished or renewed. So there was um, the work done on the roads. Um, money was set aside to develop certain areas on the basis of credit. Credit was made available to allow um, landlords to refurbish their buildings. And this, of course, has led to a situation in which rents have risen extremely. 146% rent increase on average in Neukölln over the last 10 years. And I believe the value of real estate has risen by as much as 300%. So that's really a crazy development. So building new apartments in the north of Neukölln. These buildings are not even for the upper echelons of the middle class. Though not even those people can afford them. These are apartments that are being built for the wealthiest people in society. And we also have the conversion of um, rented apartments to uh, apartments that are for sale. Um, and so this has really transformed um, the, 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 the structure of, of, of the local population. And this is something that has happened over the last 15 years. And what they're planning to do on Hermannplatz, so it, it's been a while that there have been plans to redesign Hermannplatz. But of course, it's now that um, investors are seeing an opportunity to really um, put this into practice and to transform Hermannplatz into a completely different space. And what we've seen in the last 10 years could be called the second wave of gentrification. And this new development on Hermannplatz, where they're, uh, they're um, going about this major construction project, this would perhaps be the third wave. And this, we can expect to have significant consequences for the adjoining area. It's the third wave of gentrification in which tourism begins to assume a completely different role or play a completely different role. We already have tourism now, but we don't have the kind of mainstream tourism where you have tour buses coming to look at certain sites the way you can see in the center of Berlin. But that's the kind of thing that we can expect if they do build this kind of building on Hermannplatz. So this would also have an effect on touristification and um, give a whole different uh, quality to that development. And Zigna, the investor, has stated very clearly that they expect their project to have this kind of effect. Yes, you mentioned the term touristification. And Connie, you have mentioned that term and used that term before as well. And that is an approach to say, um, uh, to explain uh, this uh, kind of uh, structure, um, business structure, and you uh, talked about uh, the ca the ability to to adapt uh, of, of businesses, um, and Ajahn, you talked about uh, the changes uh, that uh, small business owners made depending on the uh, uh, requirements and the needs that they are trying to to meet uh, and that they are faced with. 
Conny, um, in what ways do you think Kreuzberg is changing at the moment? Do you think that uh, large uh, uh, companies such as uh, Sigma are changing the uh, the makeup uh, of the neighborhoods, but also change the uh, the small uh, the small businesses and the uh, the commercial spaces? And uh, David, I want to you ask ask you uh, later on uh, about the Latin village as well. Um, is the Latin village? Uh, could it be a counter uh, a, a blueprint um, a project, a counter project uh, against uh, these large uh, developments um, um, for more for smaller uh, developments uh, and for small businesses that uh, the, to keep the profits within and the benefits within the community uh, and to to build that kind of wealth uh, for the community. So, where do you? How has that changed the structure of business owners um, and businesses in, in Kreuzberg? And where do you see the actors uh, driving this process to um, uh, to bring in more corporate um, uh, actors and investors? Well, not as much as at, at Hermannplatz. Um, there's a specific kind of uh, displacement uh, that uh, that is that is that is playing out. We see that in Neukölln. And we see that in Kreuzberg as well. Many cannot afford their rents uh, uh, for their shops, for their um, commercial spaces. Um, so, and they are um, expecting uh, uh, prices to uh, to increase as well. So, the uh, the commercial rents are increasing. Um, that's what we're seeing in in Kreuzberg as well at Oranienstraße as well. Um, up until recently, um, a fifty-six uh, uh, percent increase in the um, um, of um, uh, tenants that have been uh, driven out um, because um, the um, um, the owners are claiming uh, uh, personal needs and personal requirements, so they're claiming these uh, um, these uh, residential units for themselves. Um, so that has uh, that has changed uh, the uh, uh, makeup of the uh, uh, and the structure um, of also residential areas in our neighborhood. Many um, um, uh, apartments are vacant um, and are offered as um, accommodation for tourists, um, a centro or Deutsche Wohnen or Vonovia. It's not these large um, uh, corporates. They are not pursuing um, certain business interests in Kreuzberg. Uh, so it's a special uh, example, it's a special case at. Uh, at Hermannplatz, uh, we don't see that same thing happening uh, in Kreuzberg. Um, I actually have a question to Nilufa. Um, I thought we would have a discussion here on the panel as well. Uh, I'm skeptical, still skeptical, as to whether this discussion that has been initiated uh, actually leads to a uh, leads us to a place where we can uh, where where decisions are being taken. So we have to determine also. Um, how these decisions um, in this investigation that is being uh, started, that has been initiated, and we talked about this in working groups, how uh, they can be part of this uh, concept procedure. We don't have any information on that. I asked about this. Um, even the organizers were not able to give uh, any information on that, and that's a disaster, I think. So there's a mock uh, procedure that is being initiated, and uh, the Senate has already taken its decisions. Um, and we can only resist by, you know, uh, placing conditions on that. Um, um, I think the policymakers have already made their decisions. That's my uh, sense, anyway. And regarding Tottenham, I r really appreciate um, that that example and that that project. Um, the, this uh, market 
Uh, I don't want to discredit um, that example. What I see, however, is a, is a big difference because the area uh, in, in which the market is uh, used to belong to the city of London. So you have some access to that, uh, to that land. But the land here in Berlin... So what the uh, the districts uh, own and and the and the city owns, uh, all this has been sold off. We don't have any access to that land. We don't have any say uh, over this uh, over this land. And I also have a question to you, David, if I may, ask you a question as well. So. Yeah, the market has been has been vacant uh, for a long time due to COVID, but also due to these uh, restructuring that's going uh, on. And the small business owners and the traders that uh, moved elsewhere in the meantime, when they come back and move back in, um, will they have the same conditions um, as, as, as before, the same rents and so on. And what about the environment, the surroundings uh, in the neighborhood? Uh, that has changed as well due to gentrif gentrification, especially Tottenham. Uh, there, there's, there's been two waves of gentrification, uh, I think, in Tottenham, where uh, a lot of um, new developments have, um, have, have taken uh, place and, and there was a lot of renovation and refurbishment going on. What about the customers, uh, the old cus customers from back then? Uh, will, there still, will they still be there as well? Are they still there as well? So that's what we're wondering here as well. If we have uh, the shops here and the, and the, and, and the retailers, um, uh, will they still have customers, their old customer base or uh, Will there only be tourists that are interested in that, uh, or will there only be tourists as customers? Uh, David, do you want to respond directly? Thank you very much. Um, there, it feels as if there are a few questions there. I'll, I'll see if I can remember them all. Um, the first one, when it comes to the the idea that the composition of the area might have like permanently changed, um, particularly because of surrounding developments, I would say that some of those developments remain quite localized and fairly distant from where the, the market is currently located. I think there are only a handful of, of what I'd consider like big, large-scale regeneration developments. So the area definitely does feel as if it remains a working class, ex extraordinarily diverse area at the moment. Um, because of the dynamics of London as well, you do have um, particular areas in South London and North London, the, the market in North London and the area around Elephant and Castle that do cater towards the Latin American community. And they have remained a draw regardless of the, um, the, the, the wider changes, particularly around housing. The, what you find a lot in Seven Sisters and you used to find in Elephant and Castle is that people would travel very long ways to, to find these spaces principally because the sense of identity created is such a strong one. People go there um, and they feel as if they're instantly back home, essentially. There is this very unique character around it, which feels as if when you step into this space, you're in a different country. You, the, the, the principal language there is Spanish and it's, it's kind of incredible. Um, it's a space that has its own set of rules and those rules don't exist anywhere else. So I would say that it would continue to act as this incredible draw um, to the whole of London and actually it's the it's kind of audience is even beyond London a lot of the time um, the current plan for the market we have an architectural proposal which we developed very collaboratively with the traders and we're working on the fourth one um, there have been three of them previously it's something that's been developed since uh, since 2007 um, and because of that we have this this proposal that's based off of a lot of participation and co-design, but alongside the architectural proposal, we have a business strategy. And core to the business strategy or the business plan is the idea that rents remain at the same level as, the, as they are at the moment. Um, I think we recognize that one of the great successes of the market has been providing this low-cost space to allow anyone um, anyone within, within that community who, who needs a space to have it and to develop it themselves. Um, so you mentioned the idea of community wealth or developing community wealth. I think, again, that is an incredibly core, core um, principle of what we're trying to do. We recognize that what we're doing can present an alternative to a, a vision of development that's completely extractive. And it's run by these, a lot of the time, international developers that remove money from a local area and don't provide further opportunities to reinvest it. Um, 
so that's this core idea um, within everything that we're doing. And I think it can be observed at the scale of what we're proposing, which is the idea that any profits um, generated from from our proposal, from the the taking advantage of all this vacant space, will then be reinvested either within the building itself or to provide potential subsidies to traders to help them um, if necessary, but also reinvested in the local area on other projects. And that's actually been um, a, a really key idea within the proposal from the very outset. So from 2007, this was, this was the alternative that uh, rather than having this kind of extractive proposal, there is something that could be an engine for further development in the area. And I think actually that idea of community wealth can be observed at a much smaller scale um, within the units that the traders run themselves. So as I mentioned before, you have what might be a shop or a cafe really function as the, having these multiple roles that, that it can adopt, one of them being education, another like rights and advice. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do, to have these multiple roles offered by this one space, but a bit more widely throughout the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and what you also find is, if you provide that space, that low cost space for traders, they will invest the profits in it themselves. So a lot of the credit, a lot of the, I guess the magic of the market comes from this period of appropriation of space and of creating these spaces and building these spaces themselves. Um, and that's essentially what we're trying to do, but at a much larger scale. So I, I do think, and it's a process as well that's run by the traders themselves, by the people who use the space, by the communities who use the space. So I do feel as if what we're proposing could hopefully function as this alternative or this this further model for other sorts of schemes throughout the rest of London. We've heard uh, some um, sort of a vision of a city for all and how to uh, create those, build those spaces. David, you raised uh, an issue that I really appreciate, which is community wealth. Um, the idea of community wealth, the idea of um, a wealth of a community that is measured not only by um, the spaces themselves, but also um, the the uh, the uh, the meaning of those spaces. For example, education. So that could be something on the way towards a vision uh, of a city for all and spaces that are inclusive uh, and that do not use racist principles uh, to exclude uh, people or, or other uh, ex exclusionary um, uh, practices to exclude people. And on that note, I would really like to hear from the others as well. What are your visions and your concrete steps towards uh, a livable city with spaces that are not governed by a, uh, the logic of profit, uh, but uh, governed by uh, these ideas of inclusion, uh, creative spaces, trans transcultural spaces, as you mentioned, uh, Erchan. So where is is this vision being, uh, being uh, becomes, where does it become visible and what are uh, further steps that we can take. Um, maybe you can um, speak to that from your perspectives um, um, regarding the uh, uh, the different um, um, uh, the different state of uh, uh, resistance and struggles uh, that you are a part of. Thank you. Um, well, I think what's really important is to. Uh, give rights to the people, rights to, uh, of participation and uh, real participation and real uh, co-design. Um, and that they are being taken seriously. That is a real important issue and that extends to, um, to politics as well. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say we need um, an, an urban planning um, it's not enough to say, okay, we have these spaces, we're going to build uh, some uh, uh, residential units uh, and the, we'll, we'll, we'll think about the rest later. Um, we need a different urban planning, which also includes, for example, uh, creating spaces for uh, diverse communities and also maintaining and preserving um, spaces for small business owners. Um, the commercial spaces and commercial units. Um, and regarding the commercial spaces, uh, which is a topic for us as at, at Oranienstraße as well, we need development plans for these commercial spaces, uh, which means that the district and also the, the uh, and, and Berlin um, has to be uh, the landlord or could be a landlord uh, on a cooperative basis. Um, and we made this proposal also for Hermannplatz and Sigma, um, depending on this building that is that is supposed to be uh, built. 
the districts in Neukölln and Kreuzberg, they could be part of a cooperative project or model that is used to um, rent out spaces um, as a commons. And then, uh, um, then the uh, use rights uh, would be, uh, and then Sigma, the, the corporate, would have to uh, give away basically their use rights um, uh, for these, uh, of these, for these spaces. Um, and also, it, when we think of commercial spaces, it's also important to to create uh, tax incentives for certain types of. Um, uh, of, of businesses, uh, to create a diversity of businesses, uh, allow a diversity of businesses, uh, and also to um, uh, to fight against uh, vacancies. Uh, so for vacancy, there should be a, a, a punishment, and they should not uh, be used uh, for other purposes um, other than commercial uh, pr uh, purposes uh, well, um, by small uh, uh, businesses. Um, of course, the question of um, uh, of ownership is a is a central question that we have to tackle as well. Um, and this campaign, Deutsche Wohnen und Co. and Eignen, uh, for this for um, expropriation, uh, it, it does not. It is. It, it's not just about Deutsche Wohnen. That's the the the, the corporate, uh, but also other. Um, uh, uh, corporations um, that have more than 3,000 uh, residential units. Uh, um, so we need to bring um, um, housing into public ownership uh, again. So, you, Connie, you talked about cooperative uh, models. Uh, you talked about uh, public ownership, dem democratic um, uh, ownership. And Ilufa, uh, what would you like to add? Yes, in our debate on uh, Hammernplatz or around Hammernplatz. Uh, it's important to note that there has been a, a decision which has been signed by the Senate and the uh, uh, the, cor uh, the corporation. And this memorandum of understanding um, has basically paved the way uh, for uh, th uh, this historic uh, building that's supposed to be uh, uh, built and the restructuring that's supposed to take place at Hermannplatz accompanied by um, a participation by civil society. So we see in the article that that, that is part of that memorandum, uh, there's a contradiction. So we, we, we have made this decision, but now we're allowing you a place at the table, uh, and you can, you can have a say. So there's a contradiction there, and it's, a, it's quite ridiculous. Um, and that's what we are uh, grappling with right now. And it's a huge distraction as well, because we have been forced, we are being forced to respond, to, to react to things that have been, um, that have been decided um, uh, elsewhere. Um, so we, we, it's, it's hard for us to 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 be in a in a in a in a, in a, in a space where we can say what is it we want because we're constantly we're continuously forced to react to what's being decided elsewhere. Uh, so that's the uh, predicament we find ourselves in. Uh, we have th there's a lot we have to do. We have to think about uh, what kind of future do we envision? What kind of city do we want in the future? Um, how do we envision a department stores in in that in our cities? Um, we also grapple with the question of uh, uh, of the climate uh, uh, crisis. We're wondering: Will we be able to live in this city uh, in 20, 30 years' time? Will we be able to care for ourselves? How do we organize uh, our our societies? Do we want to uh, build more buildings? Uh, should we? Uh, start talking about redistribution because we have enough housing space, right? Um, these are the questions we're not able to tackle um, because the investors, they're coming in and, 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 uh, and taking over. Um, they are in a position of power um, uh, because they're able to say, okay, if you don't conform to my uh, wishes, basically, then um, I'm going to lay off uh, a couple of thousands of, uh, of people. And uh, so 
concessions are being made. And uh, so we are prevented from uh, thinking about our future and envisioning our future uh, because we uh, have to defend our everyday spaces to, uh, to exist, to continue living, to survive, first of all. Uh, that is one of the major problems we are faced with. And uh, at Hermannplatz, um, we th I think uh, we need to um, talk about, is it right uh, for a, um, um, a, a real estate uh, corporation to own a department store, uh, for example? Should we have um, a, a department store in that uh, place? Because in many of the cities, we don't have these central department stores any longer. The online uh, business has has been uh, promoted, and uh, uh, so department stores uh, are not as uh, um, important any longer. But that, you know, this whole online business or this whole shift uh, is, of course, uh, has has dire uh, ecological consequences. So it's a huge uh, thing that we are grappling with. Um, so uh, socialization of uh, of social services of utilities that is. Um, that is uh, what we have to talk about um, instead of you know talking about do we do we want less traffic at Hamas plus of course it's also an important question but um, that of traffic but we just have to stop uh, traffic um, you know that kind of that kind of traffic once we we, we get rid of the, this uh, traffic we can come up with new ideas but as long as the car industry uh, you know, is where it is uh, and, and has this power, um, it, it doesn't really matter uh, whether, you know, traffic goes through Hermannplatz or uh, through some other uh, place if it's rerouted. Uh, so we, we have to talk about the structural issues uh, in a systematic fashion instead of, you know, uh, trying to uh, bring about improvements and talk about, you know, small possibilities. Um, to improve things there. Thank you. Um, with respect to what Connie and Nilufa said, um, do you, what do you think is the potential for the Latin village? Can you um, respond to the, the, the larger questions for the Latin village, or should we begin with uh, the, the smaller questions, if you will? Um, I think we have to begin with all questions at the same time. Um, I think we're very careful with with the, with the proposal that we have, that we have a responsibility to address wider questions at the same time. I think you raised some some points around um, this, the incredible waste that comes from demolishing buildings and building new buildings. So I think something that we're increasingly trying to adopt is this idea that we should refurbish more of our buildings. We should look to um, ecologically more sustainable alternatives to to architecture and to development. And I think as we continue to develop what we're doing at the moment, we will try and integrate those ideas further. And there's there's a lot that we can do, and there's a lot that's already being done, particularly around ideas like the circular economy. Um, so we're, we're trying to address those wider questions because it's, I think, particularly as architects, it's our responsibility to take a position. And our position should be one that makes our physical environment a happier, friendlier, healthier place. Um, it, it, we shouldn't really engage in in the destruction of our cities. Um, but then, I guess at the smaller scale as well, we have to make sure that what we're doing and what we're proposing works for the, uh, I think principally the traders themselves. It can allow them to continue trading and creating this wonderful space as they have, as they've, as they, as they've shown they can. And a lot of that is through, yeah, some, some like great, greater amounts and greater democracy, I guess, in the way that we run the building and what we're proposing, but also participatory and co-design processes, integrating those wherever we can, and acknowledging that the building itself has to principally function for the traders, but the rest of the community itself, and have the capacity to evolve as a space. We can't think of it as a building to exist for the next 50 years. It has to be for the next 200. Um, I think, I hope I've answered the question there. Thank you very much. Ajahn, um, if you would like to say a few closing words, um, please do so. Or perhaps you would like to speak to the question of how Koti might develop in the future. What would be your future of this space? Will Kafi Koti still exist in 200 and years? Well, that would certainly be wonderful. But I am very concerned that if we don't develop new methods, and new ways of acting, 
because Conti is the center of Berlin. And I'm very concerned that we may lose this space because we are dealing with large corporations who are constantly active and who are very interested in these kinds of spaces. So it's a question of preserving the status quo and of assuming responsibility. People's concerns about the future need to be addressed. This space has to be a space that is available to everyone. And it's then that we can think about how to develop it further. And every small business is always at risk of looking only at its own balance sheet, thinking only of itself, and therefore we need to build solidarity. We need to learn to act together. So it's a question of changing mentalities. If we can bring this about, then we have the power to oppose capital and politicians. So I'm sure that the city has plans for Koti that are just, they're just waiting for them to have an opportunity to implement them. They can wait for several years. They can wait for perhaps the um, small businesses to move out. If I look at Koti, if I without looking to other areas nearby, such as Hermannstraße or even London, then how how can I how how is that solidarity? I have to look to other places. We need to network between neighborhoods and between cities. So we're dealing with small business owners who are not even properly middle class. And it's important that they don't think only of themselves. Their concerns need to be addressed in such a way that they learn to see themselves as part of a larger whole. The city of Berlin has sold so many buildings to private investors. It's sold them to capitalists from all over the world. So we need to be vigilant. And I'm, I'm concerned that we ordinary people will no longer be able to access certain spaces. So we need to defend people's right to live in these spaces. And if we need to develop new ways of thinking adequate to our century and we need to act in common. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our other guests. I'd like to thank Connie Nilofa and David, as well as you, Adjan. We've touched on a great many issues in our discussion. We, we began with the meaning or the significance of small businesses for immigrant communities. Um, in a city, and we closed with these major questions of how we can make our cities more inclusive and how we can defend the right to housing. And we also touched on the struggle against the climate crisis. And I would like to 
I, I don't really have anything to add to what has just been said. I'd like to say goodbye to our listening audience, and I'd like to once more thank all of our speakers tonight. Thank you very much.